Welcome uh, to another webinar of WIFPEL, World on Initiative on Financial Policy and Regulation. We are very happy to have uh, John Morley here from Yale and uh, Rob Jackson from NYU uh, talking about SPAC. And I will turn it over to Peter to start the discussion. Thanks very much, Itai. And uh, welcome to all of you attending this uh, uh, webinar are SPACs illegal investment companies? Question is posed to us by uh, our authors, John Morley and Rob Jackson, who've written a wonderful and provocative white paper that's posted on our website, link available on the same flyer that brought you to the, to the webinar itself. I encourage you to download it, engage with these ideas, and pay close attention for the, over the next hour. We'll not only get a summary of the main arguments and uh, importance and the stakes of this important debate about capital formation, the relationship between economic function and regulatory form, about how the different moving pieces of our securities regulation system function. But we'll also go further and understand exactly what the purpose of the Investment Company Act is, how SPACs function uh, within and sometimes without that purpose, and how uh, real ideas from experts and scholars uh, can shape the policy and business climate, as indeed has uh, has, has occurred uh, with Rob and John's uh, ideas. And so, with that, let us let us begin uh, with uh, a question uh, to to our authors. Assume that our audience is reasonably well informed about how things like initial public offerings work, and about how the difference between private and uh, and public capital markets and the responsibilities that public corporations have to their shareholders and the like. Introduce for us then this curious, relatively new creature, the SPAC, and how, have the, how has the explosion of SPACs over the last few years changed the investment landscape in the United States compared to other investment vehicles that might serve the same purpose, principally the initial public offering? Thanks, Peter. It's a real pleasure to be here, uh, and Itai as well. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak. We've been living and breathing these ideas for the last year or so, a little more than that even, and it's wonderful to be able to have a chance to talk publicly about them. Um, our basic view of SPACs is that they are the latest product of the investment fund management industry and that their natural extensions of the existing line of products that the investment fund industry has already created. The investment fund industry works basically by establishing an advisor organization, which then sets up a bunch of funds. It fills the funds with assets of various kinds and charges fees to the public investors who invest in those funds. SPACs operate in pretty much the same way, which is why SPACs are often operated by the same people who manage investment funds. So the way a SPAC works is that um, an investment, often an investment fund manager, such as say Goldman Sachs, will form an empty shell, take it public by selling stock and warrants to investors in the public markets, invest the cash that's raised in securities, usually uh, US Treasury securities, for a period of time ranging from about one year to about two and a half years. And then at some point over that time, we'll attempt to use it to acquire an interest, usually by merger, in an operating company. In so doing, it will take the operating company, which is usually previously a private company, it will take that company public um, and thereby, some people say, turn, the, turn this back into a vehicle for taking companies public. Um, the sponsors of these SPACs, the, the investment managers and others who establish these things, take a large chunk of the equity of the SPACs as compensation for their work. The chunk is usually about 20% of the total shares outstanding at the time of the SPAC goes public, which turns out to be a lot of money. If a SPAC has, say, $500 million, a sponsor can net something on the order of about $100 million in compensation. And Peter, um, uh, let me uh, first of all join John in uh, thanking you and Itai for having us for this conversation. And as a as a Wharton and Penn graduate, um, I'm just delighted to see the um, uh, the commitment that you both have brought to bringing ideas to bear um, uh, in public policy. Um, uh, and uh, it's been my very great privilege to work with John on doing just that. I wanna say just a little more about um, uh, your question, Peter. You asked, let's think about SPACs as a potential um, 
alternative to or competitor for the traditional book running IPO process with which many of your um, uh, uh, um, uh, viewers are no doubt familiar. Um, those who advocate for the use of SPACs more generally have pointed out that the initial public offering process in the United States is, um, uh, as has been traditionally executed, can be expensive for investors. Um, Jay Ritter famously in the Journal of Finance pointed out that um, uh, the 7% spread is a consistent and a fairly sticky price point for accessing public capital in the United States. Um, also, there are all kinds of regulatory barriers and fees, Section 11 liability among them, for taking companies public through the traditional route. And so um, many would argue that SPACs have served the separate capital markets purpose of providing another vehicle um, to public capital. Um, um, I can say a little more about my own view about that thesis. I have reason to be skeptical of it, but I think that's a, a, a context that your viewers should have. Very good. Well, we'll look forward to that skepticism and uh, 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 in, in just a few moments. I want to say just a quick word before turning the, the next question over to, to Itai, uh, and that is this webinar is meant to be a conversation. That's not just a conversation among the four of us, but with all of our uh, our great attendees as well. So please feel free, if you are watching this webinar, look down at the Q&A tab and uh, submit your questions to, to John and Rob uh, to answer uh, on, uh, you know, everything is on the table about capital formation SPACs, and especially as we will get to in just a few moments, there's sp the specific ar arguments that they raise in this whip for, uh, white paper. Itai. Yeah, thank you, uh, John and Rob, uh, for introducing the, the topic. Uh, let me follow up exactly where Bob stopped, uh, and this is the parallels that we have between SPACs and IPOs, uh, because your white paper and your whole thesis is about SPACs as uh, investment companies, and you argue that they need to be regulated as in, according to the uh, Investment Company Act. However, I think among many economists, uh, finance people, practitioners, uh, people are thinking about this more as a, another way to do an IPO. And I think there has been a lot of debate, uh, you know, whether this is a better way to take a firm public, uh, there are some advantages, disadvantages. Uh, so how do you think about that? And how does this affect uh, your thesis that we should really just think about it as an investment company? Rob, you want to take that? Sure, I'm happy to say a bit about that, John. I think you're right to suggest that many folks think about this as an alternative to the IPO. So let me say a little bit more about the skepticism I hinted at about that thesis uh, a few moments ago. Uh, first of all, um, as Michael Klausner and his co-authors have pointed out in extensive work on the subject, um, the notion that SPACs offer competitive or comparative advantages to the traditional book run IPO process, ETI, just doesn't hold up to careful scrutiny of the evidence. Um, often those who are pitching SPACs as a product say that it's quicker or more certain. Uh, Klausner's co-authors show that it is neither. Um, they can't possibly claim that it's less expensive because as John has explained, the sponsor compensation in connection with SPAC IPO is, um, uh, is quite significantly greater even than the sticky 7% solution that Jay Ritter pointed us to in the Journal of Finance some time ago. Uh, what's more, uh, the um, uh, SPAC's performance post business <coughs> combination um, uh, doesn't look anything like traditional IPO book run uh, performance post business combination. Um, uh, we can go back to the um, to the Journal of Accounting um, uh, research paper from a few years ago. Lori Dimitrova showed, I thought quite comprehensively uh, in the previous generation of SPACs, um, very significant negative performance. So it's, I just think that um, fundamentally, it's not, um, it's not a compelling thesis on the evidence that we have that what's happening is competition with the traditional book run process. Instead, what you have is a selection process where systematically lower quality firms are taken public by way of SPAC. Um, and as Klausner's co-authors have shown, the, the costs of that are generally borne by retail shareholders who fail to redeem at the business combination stage, unlike the institutional investors who tend to hold the SPAC prior to that stage. Um, so, um, so I have to say, uh, as, a, as a regulatory or other kind of arbitrage, it's just not a compelling thesis on the evidence that we have. So this, so building on this, uh, uh, what is at stake then by by this, as you as you call it, Rob, regulatory arbitrage? If you're right, then and uh, and please feel free to to answer expansively here to summarize your basic thesis. But if you're, if, as I understand it, if you're correct that SPACs 
are uh, or uh, or should be uh, seen as as uh, investment companies for purposes of securities regulation. Um, is that is that just kind of a, a thing that the kid at the back of the classroom points out? It's like, well, technically, I mean, these are kind of should be regulated in a different kind of way. Or is there real is there real economic meat on this bone? If you're right, what happens then to all the SPACs that we already have and all the SPACs that might come uh, uh, about uh, in future? Maybe I'll take a crack at that. I think in order to understand what's at stake, you first have to understand the argument for why SPACs might be investment companies within the meaning of the Investment Company Act. There's really two reasons. The first is that SPACs are economically structured like investment companies. Uh, one of the things I've written a lot about is the notion that investment funds are unusual among large forms of enterprise in being managed entirely by external managers. A hedge fund or a mutual fund or a venture capital fund typically has no employees of its own. Instead, it relies entirely on the efforts of an outside investment advisor for its day-to-day -day operations and investment selections. A SPAC does the exact same thing, almost the exact same thing, which is why so many of the same people who manage investment funds, Pershing Square, Goldman Sachs, Cerberus, Fortress, also manage SPACs. That pattern of relating to managers creates a very unusual set of agency conflicts that don't necessarily appear in other kinds of companies. Among other things, it means that investors and their elected representatives and the board of directors can't really control managers directly in the way that they might do in an ordinary public company. You can't fire uh, all of the workers in a SPAC because a SPAC doesn't really have any workers. Um, and the Investment Company Act was designed to regulate those distinctive problems. And so it's our conviction that the Investment Company Act has a set of tools to address and alleviate the problems that come from that peculiar pattern of relating between companies and their managers. The second argument is that the text of the Investment Company Act itself focuses not so much on structure, but on assets. An investment company is a business that invests primarily in securities, whose assets, whose primary business is investing in securities. We argue that SPAC satisfy this definition because between the time of its IPO and the time it does its business combination, a SPAC invests all of its assets in securities. Now, there's really two ways of getting out of that argument that companies have employed over time. One is to say, no, actually, we're running a real business here. Yes, we hold a lot of securities now, but we also own factories. We have employees. We have branding operations. And so we're running a real business. Lyft, the ride-sharing app, for example, makes that argument. Snowflake, the human resource management, enterprise management software, makes this argument quite successfully. Um, then there's a second strategy, which is to say, well, look, what we're doing now is like an investment company, but eventually we're going to do something else. That's the argument that SPACs make. They say, yes, 100% of our assets and income are derived from securities now, but a year from now, two years from now, we're either going to acquire a real business or operate. All right, so the reason I give you that lengthy background is to answer your question directly, Peter, about what's at stake. There's really two possibilities here. One is SPACs could comply with the investment company. They could register as investment companies and comply with its requirements. If they were to do so, the sponsors of SPACs would basically have to extract a lot less value and they would have to do it in ways that are much more transparent and clear. That's the point of the investment company. Act. A second possibility is SPACs could restructure themselves to avoid ever having to comply. And since SPAC's principal argument is that eventually they will do something else, they could say, well, we're going to accelerate the timeline. Because when SPACs argue that eventually we'll do something else, the whole question becomes, well, how long is too long? Right? One day is clearly not a problem. But there's a lot of law out there that says one year, anything more than one year, is a problem. And the SEC has recently proposed a rule, apropos of our, of our efforts here, that would say, if you don't sign a deal within 18 months or close the deal within 24 months, you will face serious questions about your status as an investment company. So as a practical matter, I will say it's very unlikely that SPACs are actually going to comply with the Investment Company Act. And so what's really at stake is whether they will place a time limit on the length of their efforts to search for acquisition targets. <laughs> 
So I, I think a natural follow-up question to that is, uh, what is the economic rationale of the whole SPAC structure? If th the way that you are describing it, uh, I think sounds like it is kind of a regulatory arbitrage. And I think once you close this regulatory arbitrage, then we are left with just another type of investment company. The question is, do we need one? Uh, we already have several. Uh, so so is, there, is there a broader economic role for SPAC? How do you see them progressing beyond that? Well, it's, so let, me, let me say a little bit about that. So SPACs um, have existed for 25, 30 years. Um, and um, uh, their history is not the, the history of the, of the recent SPAC boom. Their history is um, that SPACs were used for special purposes. That is, for example, occasionally um, for um, acquiring a, a company in a relatively short period of time or for holding cash uh, for that purpose um, for a relatively short period. They may be special cases like those where, um, uh, where SPACs can and would be useful. Um, and um, again, I'm skeptical about the economic value of this particular regulatory arbitrage just because Itai, when I see regulatory arbitrage, it's usually cheaper or quicker or easier and as uh, Klausner and others have explained it's not these facts are none of those things. So it doesn't give you the standard um, 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 uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage story. It's a rent extraction story in my view. It's, um, it's rents for sponsors and their lawyers and their bankers and such. And to the degree that John's right, um, uh, and we uh, constrain those things by um, forcing compliance with a statute that's aimed at rent extraction from investment funds. I agree we might get less of SPACs. Um, and I have to say, um, I, I'm not uncomfortable with that possibility. Itai, just to be clear, um, uh, to describe some of the market dynamics that exist now uh, in the SPAC market, uh, two things have happened um, since, um, uh, well, three things I should say have happened since we sued. Uh, first, as um, uh, John hinted, the SEC proposed a rule, um, the premise of which is that our hypothesis is correct. Um, that um, SPACs can be investment companies if they go on for too long. Um, uh, at the same time, um, uh, SPACs increasingly have shortened their search period. Um, uh, and there are fewer SPACs going public now than there were earlier. Now, I'm not here to tell you, this is Wharton, so I'm not going to be fool enough to claim causation of any of those things. But I do think there are interesting dynamics for the following reason. To the degree that the value of a, of a, to a SPAC for the sponsor is an option. We know how to map about, uh, to model the value of an option, Itai. And one of the determinants of that model is time. The longer um, the sponsor has to search, the more valuable the option is to the sponsor. If there are constraints for shorter search periods, um, that option will be less valuable. Um, and if the principal story for why SPACs are so prevalent at the moment is a rent extraction story, you will see less of them. Why? because it is rents that has been driving the prevalence of the vehicle. And if the rents are reduced, you will see fewer of them. That's at least one possible explanation for the state of play uh, in the SPAC market at the moment. Let me say one more thing, incidentally. Um, you know, the SPAC boom that occurred in 2000 and, and to a lesser degree in 2021 is just now coming to really its most interesting phase in my view, because these SPACs have been searching for a long period. They have generally been unsuccessful in finding targets and they've got to decide what to do. One thing that we've done in the litigations that we pursued, and we can talk more about this, is we've demanded that the SPAC send the money back to their investors um, um, because continuing to hold it outside of the state uh, uh, of the 12 month period is in our view a violation of the Investment Company Act. Uh, we sued three SPACs about a year ago, um, advancing this thesis. Two of them have um, redeemed uh, their shares, including Bill Ackman's $3 billion um, uh, vehicle. Um, and we're wondering, um, or we think it's important economically, Itai, to pay close attention to what SPACs will do late in their search phase. Um, to the degree that the Investment Company Act can be used to encourage SPAC sponsors who have not found a suitable target to do the right thing and redeem the shares and send the money back, um, uh, I think that would be beneficial for many investors, especially because we know from Lori Dimitrova and others that SPACs tend to do the lowest performing, worst quality transactions toward the end of their search period. So I'm reminded of a big debate that we were all having in those glorious years when Corona was, uh, as I'm told, a not very satisfying uh, beer, and we it was everyone was living in a uh, different pre-pandemic world. 
And that was the big 2018 initial coin offering debate. ICOs, there was something new under the sun. We saw that all of these, these firms and these companies, real enterprises, investment companies, found a new way to engage with others. Don't dare call them investors, certainly don't call them securities. This was brand new. And it comes, of course, before another uh, asset uh, frenzy bonanza in crypto that came in 2020. But the ICO process, once the SEC said, uh, yeah, these are these are securities and you have to go through the securities process. There's no such thing as this for the vast majority of what we are seeing. And, you know, there's good academic research, including from some of our colleagues here at Penn uh, and elsewhere, is basically saying, yeah, these are these are frauds top to bottom. There's just nothing here. This is this is pure, if not quite rent extraction, maybe it's in a different uh, vein, which is total total fraudulence. Um, is that what we're seeing here? I know SPACs are much older. They have a bigger history, as Rob just mentioned. But is is your argument more provocative than than uh, in fact the white paper makes it sound that these are a kind of a joke and that regulators and others were asleep at the switch and the only reason that they exist building on Itai's question your answer was because the regulatory system that's been in place since 1940 was too onerous in shifting information. Uh, to investors, and so they just were able to dodge it, cash their checks without creating value. Is that too aggressive uh, a posture for the argument you're making? And if it is, uh, why? Because it seems like we're just a small gap between what you're saying and uh, the great and near forgotten uh, ICO bubble of 2018. So we can claim that SPACs are and should be treated as investment companies without necessarily having a view about their overall worth for humankind. I think what's clear is that to the extent there's evidence out there, it is not comforting. We're not the source of that evidence. Other scholars, more skilled than me anyway, have come up with it. But my own reading of it is that it suggests that SPACs have not been generating great returns or value for investors. And I find that deeply troubling. I find it especially troubling given that I think that there are ways to regulate them, which the SEC can and should be pressing. One thing I want to make clear is that although SPACs have been around for a while, Peter, they exploded in 2020. I mean, they, they were a minor thing, probably not worth the, the political capital or human resources bandwidth for the SEC to go after them. I don't know why the SEC didn't go after them, but I conjecture those may be the reasons why. But the fact that the SEC at one point didn't enforce the law doesn't mean that it, it couldn't do so now. And it's my view that the Investment Company Act exists precisely to stop people like SPAC sponsors from extracting such gargantuan amounts of money from unwitting, unsophisticated public investors. Let me add a thought, um, Peter, because um, as a former commissioner on the SEC, I, I, I actually was on the commission around the time of the ICO boom you're describing. And I do think there's a parallel worth drawing. Um, uh, one of the things that, in it, um, uh, that a capacious securities law relies on um, is the interpretive uh, work of the of of securities lawyers and the bar with respect to advice they give clients um, uh, on um, uh, on contested questions of the application of law. And as someone who who you know my my original sin as a as a law professor Peter is that I went to business school before I went to law school. As someone who went to business school first, I always thought of lawyers as first of all expensive, but second um, uh, as providing me some reasonable sense of the risks of the various positions I was taking. You know, Peter, I remember being on the commission at the time of um, uh, the ICO boom, and my colleague, Jay Clayton, another uh, Penn graduate, um, coming out and expressing real frustration on the record with the failure of the bar to make clear that many ICOs, if not all of them, were securities. A number of firms took the position in writing um, that they were not securities. I think that position pretty close to frivolous, and so did Jay Clayton, um, and he had to come out and say so. In the case of SPACs, um, uh, the bar, um, after we filed our, our lawsuit last year, um, a group of law firms came out in a letter um, without really any logic, argument, or basis, simply stating that SPACs are not investment 
Um, John Coates, uh, the Harvard Law professor who was at the time the general counsel of the SEC, later described that position in a paper as simply a rent-seeking position of, of, of law firms, a completely unreasoned opinion. And I want to say, Peter, to give you a sense for the kind of rent extraction that's occurring among, uh, among lawyers on the subject, even after the SEC proposed its rule in March, they continued in public to advise people that the Investment Company Act simply doesn't apply to SPACs. Um, now, whatever you think about our argument, its benefits, its costs, et cetera, the truth is that the letter that the, the law firm signed was wrong. The position they took is that there is no basis, legal or factual, to think that a SPAC could ever be considered an investment company. And since then, we sued three, uh, three SPACs. They all moved to dismiss the suit. None of them got dismissal. Um, two of them have had to redeem billions of dollars worth of um, securities that um, uh, as a result of these arguments. And the SEC proposed a rule, the premise of which is that we were right. So I think actually, Peter, uh, if we want to be candid about what the parallels we can draw between the ICO and the SPAC space, it's two cases where the securities bar failed to do its job, uh, forcing regulators to step into the breach in a way that I think could have and should have been avoided if the securities bar um, uh, today were like the securities bar I worked in 20 years ago. I mean, let, let me just uh, do a quick follow-up to that. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to the analogy to ICOs that Peter started with and then you continued. Uh, you know, with, with ICOs, I think there was a, a nugget of a good idea in it. Um, and uh, there was an economic rationale. And I think like we see in many uh, manias or frenzies or however you want to call it in the history of finance, uh, there is typically some economic rationale that gets them started, but then you also have a lot of noise, fraud, however you want to think about it, uh, that, that sort of jumps on the wagon and maybe gives them bad reputation going forward. And, and I tend to believe that the same is true uh, for SPAC as well. I think there is some economic rationale, a new way to take firms public, uh, but then because of the mania, and as you said, a lot of it just picked up steam in uh, 2020, uh, because of all this mania, we ended up having a lot of bad ones, um, uh, I think, taking the, the headlines. So I, I do think, you know, to some extent, we do want to keep in mind the, the potential for some economic rationale uh, that is not just another form of investment uh, company that uh, maybe uh, is, is giving some reason to have SPACs going forward. Let me try out one economic rationale. Maybe what SPACs have done is expand or at least change the universe of financial professionals who can profit from IPO underwriting. Basically, this is just the latest in a long series of trend in which the asset management industry has crept into the traditional domains of the banking industry, right? Money market funds have have taken over a large swath of what was previously retail banking. Private equity funds have taken over a large swath of what was previously commercial banking. And now we see uh, hedge fund and private equity managers taking over a swath of what was previously investment banking. And of course, there are investment bankers involved in the uh, IPOs of SPACs, but nevertheless, much of the energy comes from traditional asset management firms. Is that an economic rationale? Well, it doesn't necessarily explain why there are efficiencies to come from this arrangement, unless we assume that asset managers have some real value to add. Um, it could be, for instance, that asset managers are good at evaluating acquisition targets and, and that their advice to public investors about which companies to take public is actually a valuable thing. I'm open to the possibility that under certain circumstances that could be true. I, I think that the efficiencies are not sufficient to support the enormous amount of value that the asset managers take for themselves. But, you know, sh changing who does a thing can be a source of efficiency. Right, and it's, I just want to say one of the things that John and I have reflected on and worked through as we considered going down this road um, and then decided to, to pursue it both as a scholarly project and as a live litigation in the real world, you know, I am not here to defend um, the um, capital allocation economics of the book run IPO. Um, you know, as someone, as I say, I went to business school before I went to law school and I was taught that the IPO um, as it grew up is sort of an interesting historical anachronism, but no one would design it on the back of a napkin as the efficient way to deliver public capital to privately held firms. Um, and so I'm all for 
the kinds of innovation um, uh, and the kind of expansion of the talent pool that is working on the topic that John has just described. There are other innovations that I think are more I'm more hopeful about, for example, direct listings um, uh, is another, I think, response to um, uh, some of the costs and um, uh, and frictions in the traditional IPO process. But as John says, my skepticism really comes from the fundamental economics of the SPAC. You'd have to have a pretty strong thesis, Ita, about the talent of the underlying um, uh, individual and choosing targets uh, and the unavailability of the traditional IPO to justify the enormous uh, extraction of wealth that occurs when SPACs um, engage in, in, in these SPAC transactions. So I want to, as business professors, we're delighted when you make fun of lawyers and uh, and think that they're, we should spend the next half hour doing that. Uh, and I, I do want to get into more detail on the role of intermediaries and if that is the source of, of so much of this um, uh, uh, just the dilemma, the rent extraction, or or even um, more, you know, more softly, uh, regulatory arbitrage. But before we do, I want to. Uh, we've got a question from the audience. Our colleague at Wharton, uh, Michael Schwert, asks about redemptions, which are a pretty important part, both on the economic structure of SPACs, but also on uh, the legal implications of your argument. Uh, Mike asks, how does the redemption right of SPAC investors fit into this argument? And a typical investment fund, the outside investors are not guaranteed to receive their initial investment plus interest. In a SPAC, there's a minimal downside risk until the de-SPAC transaction, at which time it's no longer like an investment fund. So is this really more a question of legalisms, the 12-month period versus and the uh, what the where the SPAC keeps uh, its investors' money? Uh, given the fact of these redemption rights, or uh, is this uh, is this uh, how do you how do you see this uh, this question? Well, I'm I'm glad uh, this question's been asked because this is actually one of the strongest resemblances between SPACs and investment companies. So think about hedge funds and mutual funds. One of the most fundamental features of those vehicles is that you can redeem. You can't redeem from General Motors. You can't even redeem uh, from 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 Microsoft. Right, but you can redeem from a hedge fund or a mutual fund. Um, the, let me just start by disputing one of the premises of the question, which is that in an ordinary investment fund, your return isn't guaranteed. My reply would be, well, yes, it is. A treasury focused money market fund has assets that are identical to, literally identical to the assets in a SPAC. And, 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 and also the fact that the return is guaranteed in the sense that it's invested in treasuries is a huge consideration for SPAC investors. We know, we just know that large numbers of hedge funds and other institutional investors hold SPACs as cash management tools. We know this because the overwhelming majority of SPAC investors, today it's on the order of 90% or more, choose to redeem rather than go forward with the business combinations. In other words, what the vast, vast, vast majority of SPAC investors get from their SPACs is the return on the underlying portfolio of securities. What they get, in other words, is the same thing they would get from a money market mutual fund, which is the quintessential investment company. But it's this a lot more expensive, right? They get that minus yeah. a huge chunk of fees less tax efficient and so on. Now the SPAC industry replies and says, oh, well gosh, SPACs are really bad investment companies. To which my reply is a bad investment company is still an investment company. Right? A money market fund doesn't cease to be an investment company because it charges really high fees or because it gets really bad returns. That, that is what it is. Let me say part of why this matters so much is that the, the statutory definition of Investment Company Act is kind of vague. It says you're an investment company if your primary business is investing in securities. Well, what is a primary business? It's sort of like the First Amendment. What is the freedom of speech, right? So there's an elaborate body of doctrine. And one aspect of that doctrine asks, what do investors think the thing is? Well, investors may not think that SPACs are investment funds and SPACs declare themselves not to be investment funds. But investors nevertheless treat them like investment funds, right? Hedge funds hold them as cash management tools. They treat them like treasuries because they have the same risk profile as money market funds. And so that's that's how, how people actually approach the things. And, and um, just to 
add a thought there. Um, 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 one of the, the things I've realized as we've gone through this, um, this work this year and as we've presented it to audiences like this one is um, it's, it's, a, it's a paper and a, and a hypothesis that can feel just like legal details. Um, uh, and I think that's fair. Um, um, I had to learn the um, Investment Company Act when I became a commissioner of the SEC. Um, John taught it to me, uh, something for which I will never fully forgive him. And I, um, uh, and I understand why it feels sort of like not substantive, not really economic. But for two reasons, I hope the business folks on this call will take away or those watching will take away. Um, I think it's actually quite substantive. The first is one John gave earlier. Remember, the Investment Company Act was in response to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to funds, uh, investment funds, where sponsors in the 1930s paid themselves in dilutive shares of the fund. You see, Congress saw that it's difficult for investors to value or understand the cost of dilution of an existing pool of assets in this way. That's why the Investment Company Act mandates that advisor fees be paid in cash, be transparent to investors and the like. Um, that's exactly what is happening here. So for me, it's a very standard agency problem rent extraction story, where SPAC sponsors are paid in dilutive equity rather than cash. Um, and the value of, the, uh, of those things wasn't at all clear, at least until the SEC uh, changed the disclosure regime a year or two ago. So that's a one way in which I think there's real economic substance behind the thesis we've offered. The second is that we think that the law makes clear that if um, SPACs don't want to register as investment companies, they've got to search for a limited time. And if they don't find a target in that 12 month period, they've got to return their cash. I think it's very clear that that is beneficial for investors as a matter of substantive finance, Itai, let me say why. First, as I mentioned earlier, the value of the sponsor's option to do a deal is increasing in the time they have to do a deal. Um, to the degree the law limits that time, it limits their compensation, but don't take my word for it. Over the last 12 months, increasingly SPACs have agreed to shorten the time frame that they have to search. And whatever one thinks the cause of that might be, our lawsuit, the SEC's rule, other considerations, most market participants will tell you the reason that search periods have gotten shorter is that investors have demanded. Well, Itai, that's consistent with the notion that investors think that um, uh, having too long a search period um, is costly to them and beneficial for sponsors, and they are uh, revising that bargain. So I do think application of the Investment Company Act here has a number of substantive economic consequences, as well as the legal ones that John mentioned a moment ago. So there is a follow-up here from uh, Mike Schwelt, um, and I think he highlights an important dimension of the question that also touches on something you said before, which is to try to understand better how investors were harmed uh, by the SPAC structure. It is true that you know the fact that you give them the option to redeem makes it look more like uh, an investment company however i think an important part of your argument is also that there was some rent and extraction there and investors were harmed but if you look at investors who put their money in the SPAC and choose to redeem uh, before any acquisition is done then they're basically getting their money back with interest and, and so on and i think overall evidence if you know my recollection of the economics literature that emerged around SPACs uh, recently is, is correct. I, I think we do see that investors at the end of the day uh, did get a good deal out of it. Uh, so how do you reconcile all these things together? Uh, <clears throat> let me start with a small aspect of Michael's question. He says that he didn't think money market mutual he observes that money market mutual funds were exempted from some 2016 reforms. I'm not sure which reforms you're talking about, but just to be clear, they're investment companies. Money market mutual funds are investment companies, and the fact that they're low risk doesn't exempt them from regulation by the Investment Company Act. So the, 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 the bigger question, which is a really interesting one, is if an investor redeems, is the investor really harmed by these high fees that are only charged at the moment of the transaction? And the answer is yes. First of all, because SPACs pay their operating expenses um, <laughs> SPACs pay their operating expenses from the income on the portfolios of securities. Um, and those expenses are often higher than they would be in a conventional money market mutual fund. Also, SPACs um, don't get the same favorable tax treatment that money market mutual funds do because they're not registered investment companies. Registered investment companies have a special form of tax treatment um, that allows them to avoid paying corporate income tax. 
Um, I also think more generally that SPAC investors are bearing a certain level of risk that money market mutual fund investors aren't bearing. Um, we haven't necessarily seen these risks manifest, but among other things, for example, SPACs are only required to put 90% of their assets into a trust for the benefit of investors. As a practical matter, most of them put 100%, but some of them don't and they need not, which exposes the, that money uh, to a serious risk of misappropriation by the SPAC sponsors. We don't have to believe that these risks have manifested to nevertheless believe that they're real, and worthy of regulation. I also think that SPAC investors are being exposed to a form of marketing in the form of the encouragement that they go through with these transactions that they wouldn't and shouldn't be exposed to if these things were regulated as investment companies. That is a lot of the unsophisticated investors are being forced to, to go, to go not forced, but a lot of them sort of default into going through with these transactions because they don't know any better. Let me have two quick points there. First of all, um, um, uh, Michael, thank you for these uh, very insightful questions. Let me just spend a minute um, and put in a plug for, um, uh, Michael's got a terrific paper on proactive capital structure adjustments using um, SEC filings. And even if you think SPACs can't be investment companies, you should read that paper um, because um, uh, it's a terrific, very thoughtful analysis. Um, something I hadn't, I hadn't seen. I know folks at the SEC had seen it. So, Michael, let me get right to your question, um, um, uh, um, uh, which is uh, just pressing us on what's the harm here, really. And I think John, toward the end of his response, got to me, which is the what, the, what is the substantive question, which is one of the things I learned in, at Wharton is that there's no free lunch in finance. And it's true that all the investors who redeem end up with treasury returns and a warrant kicker to boot. And that's why that's what sophisticated investors do. The problem, Michael, is that those investors, the retail investors who are not focused on the redemption decision, either who don't know about it or who overwhelmingly choose not to redeem, end up paying the enormous fees that we've described. Um, and in this way, they pay the, the tax um, uh, uh, of, uh, of the SPAC sponsor's compensation. Um, uh, there are a number of good papers um, studying this dynamic, including the Klausner paper I mentioned earlier, and also um, uh, one by Usha Rodriguez, um, uh, who's done terrific work on this as well. Um, but, but for present purposes, I would just say that um, uh, rede redeeming shareholders, uh, for the reasons John has given, do suffer some costs, but the enormous burden of the SPAC sponsor's compensation is principally borne by non-redeeming shareholders. Holders. Um, and there's reason to think that those are systematically less sophisticated investors paying less attention to the redemption decision. So uh, that leads into a question we got from an anonymous uh, attendee that uh, I want to expand on. And that is, you identify in the white paper, there are two elements of SPAC practice that uh, renders them subject, uh, arguably, to the Investment Company Act. The first you've gone into detail and in identifying, which is the uh, the uh, uh, the target date or the the acquisition date. So anything that extends beyond that 12 to 18 month period uh, is is going to make it look more like an investment company. And the other is what you do with the money in the meantime. The reason SPACs look so much like uh, and legally, in your view, should be regulated as investment companies because they look like money market mutual funds. They're going into treasuries. And so the the timing uh, question. It seems to me to pose a real constraint. It's like if you can hang out uh, either indefinitely or much longer than that regulatory period, then there are all kinds of advantages that you could get um, uh, in in the tradition of regulatory arbitrage or rent extraction. So let's put that to the side. I think asked and answered uh, in 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 uh, your critique. But the other is this liquidity question, which our our uh, attendee poses, and I'm curious about as well. If is it true then that a SPAC could just say, yeah, all right, we're not going to go into treasuries, we're going to go into bank deposits. And then done, that's just poof. A SPAC is not an investment company. They can do everything else similarly, including uh, hang out uh, indefinitely. Is it a get out of jail free card to go into bank deposits? And if that's true, does it represent a real constraint in the way that the, uh, the chronology of the acquisition might? Is there enough in this world bank deposit demand from the banks uh, to be counterparties to SPAC sponsors such that they could make the switch. And the real, we're really just talking about in a low interest, lower rent interest rate environment during the SPAC heyday of just a few bips? Uh, or or is, this, um, uh, is this a real constraint that could, uh, that could cause genuine changes in behavior uh, among SPAC sponsors? Uh, 
I think that if a SPAC invests all of its assets from the moment of, or doesn't in, in, not invest, if a SPAC takes all of its IPO proceeds and immediately and continuously places them into a bank checking or savings account until the moment of its business combination, then the SPAC is not an investment company. Let me qualify that in a couple of ways. The first is that if a SPAC puts everything in treasuries for some period of time and only later shifts everything into cash, it might still be an investment company if it put everything into treasuries for too long. Um, let me also say that the conceptual similarity between a SPAC and an investment fund remains at some level, namely the pattern of organization we described in which a SPAC is dominated by an outside set of managers, that remains whether or not the SPAC is invested in cash. But it's difficult to make a legal argument, one can't make a legal argument, that if a SPAC puts everything into cash from the very moment of its IPO, that it will be an investment company. Um, let me say, so Peter, your question, very thoughtful, is, okay, if that's a possibility for a SPAC to put everything into cash from the moment of its IPO, does the Investment Company Act really uh, represent a meaningful constraint? I think the answer is yes, for several reasons. Um, first, a lot of SPACs haven't done that, and they now have problems. And you can't, you can't change after the fact, right? There's a time limit, whether it's one year or 18 months or two years. And if you go beyond that, you're toast. Um, and it doesn't matter what you do subsequent to that. If you go, if you go on for too long, you're an investment company. Um, another reason it matters is that the Investment Company Act's definition of cash is quite constraining. Um, CDs are securities under the Investment Company Act. Um, loans are securities under the Investment Company Act. So a lot of the cash-like things that people might do aren't available. A SPAC really would have to put the money into a bank. Now, look, I'm not a banker. I don't know the banking business, but I find it unlikely that banks or SPACs are going to be excited about putting hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars into bank deposit accounts. I think that's just not an attractive thing. I also think that in this new environment, not the one in which SPACs initially, the SPAC boom started in mid-2020, but today with rising interest rates, it's not clear that investors will be willing to give up the difference between treasury returns and the returns on bank savings accounts. Um, since clearly a lot of investors care about the returns on the investment portfolio, since the vast majority of investors are redeeming, I don't think they'll be satisfied necessarily at having the whatever interest rates banks are willing to pay on this money. I don't know what interest rates banks are going to be willing to pay, but it seems to me like a potential problem. I'll say lastly that the SPAC industry's reaction to our lawsuits and to our paper, I think, demonstrates that there must be something at, spit, at stake. The SPAC industry thinks this is a problem. So I deduce that it probably would be a problem, me, a constraint, let's say. Let me uh, switch gears a little bit. We only have uh, 10 minutes left or so um, and ask another question that, that I think is, is very interesting in thinking about your uh, paper. And, and this is, what is the role of the SEC in all this? Um, what is your interpretation as to why it took them so long to, to take action here. Uh, how do you view the action that they recently took, uh, the relation it has to, to your uh, paper? And uh, do you think it's enough? Do, do you think uh, we, we are done now? The issue is resolved or there is more to do? Well, let, let me say a little bit. I want to take each of those questions uh, in turn. So first, um, uh, the SEC um, um, often comes late to these kinds of debates. And one reason is that they are a resource constrained agency that is waiting to see market developments um, uh, that are happening very quickly um, uh, to try to understand what the optimal policy is. I don't think, in fact, I know, having been on the commission until just a couple of years ago, nobody at the SEC ever imagined that special purpose vehicles would end up with $130 billion of dry powder sitting in them um, uh, with sponsors uh, with very strong incentives to do value destroying deals um, uh, in order to extract rents. I don't think anybody um, thought that was the future of the special purpose acquisition space. Um, and I think the SEC imagined um, as the, the, the space was growing um, uh, that council would be more thoughtful 
about the limitations um, uh, that SPAC sponsors um, could and should face. And by the way, I just want to be clear about something. There are many councils who, in response to our paper or the litigation, have come forward and said, um, uh, you know, um, uh, we're going to be much less aggressive in our interpretations. Um, but there are a few who are willing to continue to give advice that's just obviously contrary to what the SEC has said, the failure of any of the defendants in our suits to gain dismissal. Um, uh, it's just not a serious approach that they take into the question. So my first answer is the SEC often comes late because they're waiting for the markets to tell them what's necessary and because they're resource constrained. Um, in our case, and in many contexts, the SEC necessarily relies on the securities bar to be, as I say, more thoughtful than they were able to be here. Um, and that's happened now in a number of contexts. It's happening with crypto. It's happening with, um, it happened with ICOs. It's happened with SPACs. Um, uh, my friend and um, former colleague, Allison Lee, who just stepped down from the commission, went so far as to give a speech suggesting the SEC might have to oversee the securities bar to get them better to do their job. And that's how, in my view, how um, um, far we've come from um, uh, a, a market dynamic dynamic in which intermediaries can give hard advice. Um, I think it's very challenging to be a lawyer right now and to give that answer. And so the SEC um, necessarily had to intervene. And you asked me about their intervention. I think particularly the rule they proposed on the Investment Company Act is extremely thoughtful. Um, we've written a comment letter to them explaining um, that we think it can be improved. Um, and that comment letter made the following point, um, uh, which was sort of strange to have to make to a federal regulator. Um, uh, the, the rules proposal simply just describes the law that has existed in this space for 40 or 50 years. Reading it, it almost reads like a John Morley law review article. Look, here's the various factors, here's the background, here's the organizational structure that makes us think these things are similar. And one reaction you might have reading it is, why is it necessary for the SEC to say this? And the reason, I'm sorry to say, is that nobody else will. Um, that the bar is at a place where they're just not willing to tell people what the law is to the degree it's contrary to their financial incentives. And for that reason, um, the SEC, in my view, actually has one more step it's got to take in time, which is it's got to finalize this rule and leave no doubt in the market's mind that some SPACs can be investment companies. Um, because that is all, um, apparently, that um, uh, the bar will listen to. By the way, even on that subject, there are many in the bar who have uh, threatened the SEC in the comment file that if the SEC comes to that view, the bar will sue the SEC. Um, uh, that is, the lawyers will take the SEC to court to challenge their authority and make that determination. Um, I think those threats, like many of these, um, uh, many of these sort of lobbying dynamics at the SEC, are probably empty. Um, but unfortunately, I think the SEC has got to take further steps to finalize the rule, or else it's just not obvious that um, the lawyers in this bar are going to take the Investment Company Act seriously. So uh, I promised on Twitter at some point in advertising this event that the uh, debate was going to get spicy. And Rob, you've delivered with these uh, these pointed critiques of the securities bar. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to following up on that debate, which I think is important uh, as, we, as we think about exactly what is the role of these professional intermediaries. Uh, not not lawyers only, uh, not to, uh, to, to uh, try to exempt ourselves too much as business professors, Itai uh, and me, but uh, uh, but also bankers and underwriters and whether or not these intermediaries are gumming up a system rather than facilitating transactions uh, you know, for the uh, benefit of capital formation and efficiency of markets. And on that note, let me ask you a question about the future. So this isn't about uh, your, your white paper, not about the SPACs, but about this new creature that seems to have come in, uh, at least in part, uh, as a response to your challenge, and that is the SPARC, the uh, the special, I, I think it stands for the Special Purpose Acquisition Rights Corporation or company. The idea here, maybe I'll let you describe it. Uh, this question uh, uh, comes to us offline from, uh, from someone who's been watching this space, and it seems that this SPARC, and again, I'll let you go into more detail, is the answer from one of the defendants that you sued to say, all right, this is a foot fault, the SPAC is, we'll, we'll follow the law, we'll comply with it. And instead of taking your money now and go hunting, we'll go hunting and take your money at the time that the acquisition has been identified. And what you get in the meantime is a kind of option and it's a right, that's the R. And so because there's no capital intermediation at the, at the point of contract, there's no investment fund or investment company, 
Uh, is this is this good? Does this satisfy your concerns? So, so thinking about it, I guess more from an economic and policy perspective, unless uh, from a legal perspective, unless unless you have legal criticisms of the Spark model. What do you make of this? Is that uh, is this? Does everybody declare victory in a world where Sparks dominate? Um, let me say first of all, Sparks are never going to dominate, and the reason is that you can't really do an IPO if you're not raising cash. Like, what, what do you even, who do you even give the warrants to? Um, you, you can't do an IPO of a spark. What Bill Ackman and Pershing Square Tontine Holdings have proposed to do is to pay a dividend to the stockholders of an existing SPAC. And, and that's really the only channel the market has so far devised to get a spark off the ground. So I find it unlikely that these vehicles are ever really gonna catch fire. Um, but let's get to the heart of your question, Peter, and ask, is the new spark, assuming it goes forward and that the SEC approves it for listing on a stock exchange, assuming this actually happens, will it be an investment company? I think the answer is probably not. I need to see the actual details of how the thing works out, but probably not. And the reason is, because under the Investment Company Act, you're only an investment company if your primary business is investing in securities, and they're not going to invest in securities, at least not prior to their acquisitions, not for any meaningful period of time. Um, and so, yeah, I think it probably does solve the Investment Company Act problem. There are ways that it could become an investment company, but but I think if it's done in the plain vanilla way that Pershing Square Tontine Holdings has proposed, I, I think it's legally not an investment company. It doesn't completely erase my worries about the thing. Um, the sponsors of Sparks can take huge amounts of equity in the same ways that the sponsors of SPACs can in the ultimate target company. And that gives me the same reservations that I have in a SPAC. But as a legal matter, are they investment companies? No, probably not. I should say, um, Peter, just to add to that, in um, um, you know, uh, Bill Ackman's counsel, Steve Friedman, is one of the most widely respected, thoughtful members uh, of the Securities Bar, and in a letter um, explained to the SEC urging the approval of Sparks, and to be clear, they have not yet been approved, but um, he noted, I think quite thoughtfully, or rather his firm noted quite thoughtfully, that to the degree one is concerned about the Investment Company Act in SPAC, Sparks might be an alternative to address some of those uh, some of those concerns. Um, so um, now I will say, just to be clear, Sparks haven't been approved. Um, uh, their, the New York Stock Exchange uh, listing rule that would have led for them to be approved has been withdrawn from the exchange. Um, and to the degree that um, Ackman is still hoping for approval, it would be for over-the-counter trading rather than uh, principal exchange trading. And, that, and even still, that, that, that now, as of now, hasn't been approved. But I, I, I will say one last thing, which is that on the day we we filed our lawsuit, or, or shortly thereafter, a couple of days later, Ackman announced that his intention to shut down and liquidate Pershing Square Tontine Holdings once the spark was approved. I think that's not the sort of thing one does in response to a lawsuit one believes to be meritless, uh, as as Mr. Ackman said with regards to our lawsuit. And so, you know, to the extent we've pushed people towards a vehicle that is less problematic, even if still potentially problematic, I count that as a small victory. Okay, I think this is a good place to end with a victory. So thank you very much, uh, Peter, for co-hosting and John and, and Rob for a terrific uh, paper, terrific conversation with uh, real world impact, real impact on policy. This is what we try to do here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you.